Hi, everyone. Welcome to All Things Iceland. It's Jules, and I have an awesome guest on the show today. It's Caritas, and she is Icelandic. So, welcome to the show. Thank you. And just to give you a little bit of an overview about her. So currently she is a PhD student in England studying a creative writing, which that means that she probably have a really long dissertation <laughs> for, for that, of lots of writing there. That's exciting. But also in terms of for this interview and one of the things that she's doing that I think is incredible is that she's helping people to learn Icelandic through short, easy stories. And she previously published a book called Austrider. And her new book, Dagatal, is out and she's promoting that. So we're going to be talking about learning Icelandic, of course, right? <laughs> because this is something that many people, whether it's just a beginner who wants to learn a couple of phrases coming to the country or somebody who really wants to deep dive and be able to speak it as fluently as they can or you know, as fluently as they would like to go in terms of level, these types of stories are super helpful. So I'm so glad to be able to chat with her today in order to provide some insight and resources for people who are looking to learn Icelandic. Um, her background, she taught Icelandic in Tokyo to people who are looking to study it as a second language, as well as at the University of Iceland, Hauskoli Island. So she's definitely a professional in this you know, area of working with people like me who've been <laughs> learning the language. And so I'm really glad to have her on. So I'm excited to chat with you today, Caritas. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. And just to start off, I think it's always interesting, especially as an Icelander, to get an understanding as to why you wanted to create resources for people who, who were looking to learn Icelandic. Well, I think a lot of things circle back to yourself. So the answer to that question goes back to my own experience uh, and my passion for learning uh, languages. I was a language major in high school and then went on to learn Icelandic at a university level. Um, and then um, language uh, learning brought me to Tokyo where I studied Japanese for one year. Mm. and. Um, and taught Icelandic um, on the side, helped out in that uh, class, taught at the university there. Um, and through all of this language learning myself, I've had the opportunity to read easy uh, language stories and books that have given me a lot of pleasure in the um, process of learning foreign languages. Mm -hmm. And as I started teaching myself and being around people learning Icelandic as a second or foreign language, I, I realized that maybe we didn't have that much material, not that many sources in Icelandic. Right. So um, I thought it would be a fun idea to bring my um, love for language learning, my love for writing um, together and write short stories in easy language for Icelandic adult language learners. Yeah, great. And, Yes, and that's another thing to stress that um, my intended audience are adults, um, adult language learners. So even though I've heard that the stories are used um, at all different um, levels, um, even children seem to uh, <laughs> like the stories, which is wonderful. But my intended audience is adults because I thought there was a need to have fun, engaging topics, but mm -hmm. in simple language. So um, nothing is excluded. I, I talk about yeah. the environmental uh, crisis in easy language. Mm. I talk about Icelandic history and, and culture, all in easy language. So. Nice. And when you say easy language, what level of learning would a person need to be at in order to read your stories? Yes, uh, so my book is to bridge the gap between um, the very basic learning um, texts in textbooks and the simple conversations and to um, reading more for pleasure, longer books um, of fiction. So um, this is for uh, intermediate um, okay. beginners. Um, so the European framework 
for languages has six stages of language development. Mm -hmm. um, and this is on level um, two and three um, for the first book. And then the fourth level is added in the second book. Mm, okay. So not an absolute beginner, obviously. I think that would be very difficult just if you didn't know anything about the language and you jumped right in. But yeah, okay. So you're you you someone who's maybe like taken a course, maybe a, a level course or something like that, A1, A2 or something. Yes, it's um, great to have some background before you read the books because um, the books are um, my ideas to supplement and add to other um reading material and mm. and um yeah when you go searching for something to read they want to read something other than uh, news articles or yeah. children's books this is <laughs> where you should uh, look um but to make the stories more accessible because the range from this level two to uh, four on the scale of six is is quite big i've right. um made difficulty level uh, scales within that frame, so for ah, the books. Okay. And above the title of each story is a icon, a symbol, um, that shows the difficulty level. So it's okay. really pretty, it's it's subtle, you can't really, you don't really notice it uh, yeah, on the side. Yeah, so there's okay. four there, um, this one is on level three. Okay. Um, so at the back of the book, there is a list of which story is in, on which level, mm -hmm. but um, intentionally the stories are not uh, organized by difficulty level in the book itself because um, I wanted it to be um, a literary experience, a fun mm -hmm. experience where you go through the seasons. So Arstider means seasons. Mm -hmm. So it starts with summer, goes into fall, then winter and ends with spring. So the stories are divided up um, and um, the theme was reoccurring, um, how the seasons affect life in Iceland and what defines the seasons in Iceland is to me the light and the darkness. So um, right. there's, yeah, how that affects life here. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I think it's really cool that you did it like that in regards to the seasons. Um, also, as you mentioned, like literary journey, it's like, or, or experience, you might think oh this one story is super easy for me to understand and you go to the next one you're like oh okay maybe I should check the level of this one maybe it's, you know <laughs> some words or the way that you know it's um things are declined and whatever else that might be feel a little bit more difficult I'm, I'm assuming so that I think that's really helpful because like mm -hmm. you said I think I think maybe there's one other book that I'm aware of that has short stories that are not you know part of the um this Icelandic online course I forget what it's called mm -hmm. that it's free um you know I mean and it's a good resource but still it's like it's limited to a degree so it's nice to have like you mentioned something that is an add-on to this that actually like helps you in a different way and can be enjoyable yes and as a language learner myself I, I thought it would be fun for the reader to pick a story based on um interest so mm -hmm. find the title that interests you and read the story and and you can know the difficulty level if you want but it should be in the back of your mind or if mm. you're using it as a study tool but it can be so helpful to read stories that are too easy or too difficult yeah. because then you just um use your language skills in a different way you just think about something different if it's super simple grammar or you understand all of the words and um if you don't um then you can just look up in the dictionary more or if you're right. passionate about learning how the story ends um and the good thing is the stories are so short that it's not a struggle to finish them <laughs> right uh, yeah you can go through it step by step okay and in regards to people who are learning and that you've been around what do you feel like people are commonly struggling with when they're learning Icelandic? I think often for people, it's the speaking part, which mm -hmm. is universal for any language you learn, because it's such a big step to decide, now I'm going to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and things can't and shouldn't be perfect from the start because right. you're learning the language, but it's just that, big jump into the pool of um, yeah, swimming <laughs> against <laughs> the current and 
um, yeah, just trying to make yourself um, understood. That's the most important thing. And I think it's easy to forget to have fun when you're learning mm. languages too. It, it can be a really fun journey. And my favorite thing to, um, yeah, I, I told it to myself when I moved to Japan and I tell it to anyone who wants to hear my advice, which okay. is everything is language learning, especially when you mm. live in the country where you're, uh, if you're learning it as a second language in a new country, but right. everything can be considered as language learning regardless, whether you're reading, whether you're listening to podcasts or mm -hmm. audiobooks, if you're watching TV, it's a great, uh, great excuse to watch TV. Um, <laughs> like if you're doing it in the target language, then you're right. learning at the same time. Um, and yeah, go to the theater, go to the movies. It's all a learning process. Go meet people at a cafe, um, yep. talk with people. All of this is learning Iceland Icelandic yeah, or exactly. any other e foreign language. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend that. But, <laughs> so like, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And like, for, for instance, I'm not a person who watched a lot of television, but I will be like, okay, I'm gonna watch this movie in Icelandic and see how much I understand and see how far I can get because it can get really much more complicated when you have uh, people who are in situations. Like, granted, you can see what's happening, but context makes a huge difference, right? And like, um, I, I enjoy it, but I also get really tired, and that's the other thing. Is that I think it's nice that you have these short stories because that your brain can feel overloaded when you're trying to take in so much and you're sitting there and like your eyes just start glazing over and you're just like, all right, well, I'm going to put this down or it feels intimidating or whatever else. So I think it's a really good way to go in terms of just keeping it brief. And then you, also you feel accomplished because it's like, oh, I got a story done today. Right. And then mm -hmm. I can, then tomorrow I'll just do another one. And then it starts to compound and all of a sudden you're understanding more. Yeah, and all of a sudden you read a whole book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's a big accomplishment in the target mm -hmm. language for sure. Okay. And in regards to, like you mentioned before we started recording that you were testing out these stories on your students or like this kind of method of learning on your students. And did you find that there was a big difference for them in terms of utilizing these short stories along with their studies while they were learning the language. Yeah, so you're referring to um, this time when I was teaching uh, mm -hmm. Icelandic as a second language, and that was on level B2 um, or uh -huh. B1, so it's a bit advanced um, students. But I was using Arstidir and having the students read stories from the book, and I was uh, test running with the students some exercises that will soon be published in, in a workbook accompanying Artir. And what I found is that stories are just such a good way to start a conversation. It's um, ideal for discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's also um, great for ideas to, and jump off into writing exercises. And then, of course, in language, there's always um, the specific sentence structures or mm -hmm. phrases that come up that you can then deep dive into um, the difference between saying this and that um, and, and a specific grammatical structure that appears in, in a story as well. So yeah. it can be really helpful to see it in, in context like that, how it's actually used in written language or speech. Um, yeah, okay. And your new book, oh, thank you for that, by the way. Your new book, Dagatal, uh, could you explain how it's different than your, than Austeder? Dagatal is um, like an independent sequel. So it's okay. more stories. Mm -hmm. um, and this time around, some of the stories are a little bit longer and a bit more difficult. So um, in Austeder, there's uh, five difficulty levels, but there's six now in um, Dayatal. Um, so that way it can follow the reader. So people who um, yeah, were reading the most difficult stories last time also get something now in mm -hmm. Dayatal. Um, and the theme from Artir kind of 
comes over to Diatel a bit, um, but changes. So Diatel means calendar, which mm -hmm. um, then refers to not the seasons, but the months. So mm. now the stories are structured from January to December. Mm. Um, and I'm focusing on holidays and like bank holidays, the traditions we have regarding all of these fun uh, events or are pinpointed to one um, date, like in early uh, winter or um, early in the new year when the sun finally appears again because it's yeah. been hiding behind the mountain in <laughs> Isafjörður up north, uh, mm -hmm. northwest. Um, I write about that. That's a specific date when the sun comes and they celebrate with eating pancakes. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> and of course, there's a lot of food uh, in celebrations in Iceland, like in most countries. So there's... Um, in either February or March, I, I put it at the beginning of March in the book. Mm -hmm. um, we have the beginning of the Lent, the festivities like a carnival with Bolletauer, Splenkitauer, Paskutauer. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, mention fun, um, fun days like this and Sjómanatauer. It's mm -hmm. not an official holiday, but people celebrate the fishermen and um, how close we live um, and interact with the sea here in Iceland. Yeah. So yeah, there's absolutely great. So it's, I mean, in essence, the, the theme is always there of learning more about Iceland, mm -hmm. but just differently, like you mentioned. Right. And I think that's really cool because not only are you learning Icelandic, but now you're also getting words and understanding about the culture, which for me is always a, a huge thing for when we want to be able to explain things or talk about topics with people. And mm -hmm. Icelanders love talking about their culture. I mean, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I often think that, you know, there are some challenges that uh, Icelandic learners face. And I'm going to first I'll tell people that for, if for anyone who's interested in, you know, reading your books, I'll have links to those, of course, in the description so they can check those out. Cause I think it is really worth it, especially if this is something you want to pursue, or if you're just, you know, yeah. one of those people who likes language learning and like, maybe that you don't want to go all the way with Icelandic, but you're just kind of curious. I think this would be a lot of fun. Um, but I want to get back to like some of the challenges that Icelander, that Icelandic learners face, which can be say in Iceland, right? That there are sometimes Icelanders might talk back to them in English. And so I'm just kind of mm -hmm. curious about like, as a person who's had to teach people and probably has heard some of these frustrations, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have, cause you gave some advice already, but like, do you have any advice um, maybe for people, even Icelanders who might be listening to this or watching this, like what would be helpful as people are learning so that they feel like they're getting, you know, that interaction that they so desperately want or like the vulnerability that you feel when you, you know, put yourself out there to talk with somebody? Yes, it's just a really difficult um, situation because people have different opinions and experiences and, and needs also when learning languages mm -hmm. and not everyone is ready to um, speak at the same time and people need different support so it supports some people to actually um, go slower and they feel more included if you speak English uh, yeah. with them and um, so you also have to respect that but of course if people want to learn uh, Icelandic and want to speak Icelandic Icelanders have to be a lot more patient than they are uh, yeah. currently and just yeah um, practice hearing accent because um, it, it is a new thing for many Icelanders to um, hear accent and, and um, the, the new Icelandic. Um, yeah. So it just um, takes practice on everyone's part. And the, the biggest advice is just don't give up, actually yeah. pursue speaking. But um, I think it's, it's common with most, most languages. Japanese mm -hmm. is a, a lot... Uh, bigger uh japan is a lot bigger country and so yeah. there's more speakers there but i did also experience that with japanese i would speak japanese or write japanese to people and they would write back in english or oh, wow. speak in, in english just because yeah. they wanted to practice their english or <laughs> not sure whether i could handle reading it or something so it's just 
and I, I would ignore it. So I would just keep mm. at it with Japanese. And sometimes they would still respond or reply in, in English. So it would go on for a little bit. But yeah, so and I've he heard similar stories for Icelandic language learners. But right. I, I think it's more universal than um, maybe one would think at first. But yeah, just don't give up. It's difficult when you start thing to speak. And yeah, but you need that practice and you need to also be um, clear about what it is that people can do to help you. Mm. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, everyone has different paths and, and, and different um, pace in, in the language learning. So you just have to have those clear boundaries and say, no, now I'm actually comfortable <laughs> enough. Like, I know I said that last time I saw you, please mm. use English or something, but it's changed since, that, since then. You have to be right. flexible with me or something yeah. like that. Or yeah. like, usually I enjoy speaking with you English, but today I'm really tired and I feel really sad and homesick and I just yeah. can't handle Icelandic right, right now. Can we speak in English? So right. I think people have to be um, just flexible. It's um, yeah, common sense yeah. and human interaction. Yeah. yeah, I think that's great advice. So thank you for that. Because I do, I do think like on both sides, right? There's mm -hmm. sometimes frustrations, and there's also assumptions, right? So like that's one of the hardest things is as a learner, if you're put yourself out there and you're vulnerable, and mm -hmm. the person doesn't respond the way you were hoping, then you can assume a lot of things about why they didn't, or you can beat yourself up or whatever. And I think just from a personal experience, no, the beating yourself part up part never helps you. I mean, it only just deflates you and makes you not want to learn. But also, like you said, like you don't know what the other person is going through either, right? So like sometimes you kind of just need to like back up a little bit and explain. And if it's really not going the way we'd hoped, maybe we just exit and like maybe, you know, take the conversation somewhere else. Um, not to say that our feelings can't be valid around it, but it can, like, uh, I think, bring up a lot of emotions for people. And and also with Icelanders being so proud of their language and not wanting to feel like people are always speaking English and stuff. It Some people will try to force it. Other people, I've heard people say to me, like, they wanted to practice their English. And so they didn't really mind at all if I, if I had spoken in Icelandic. And it didn't make me feel bad. But it was also like, oh, I never really thought of that, <laughs> right? Because so many people go throughout their day never speaking English or not needing to speak English because they can do all of their business in Icelandic and then they come across them and they're like, Ooh, opportunity. Right. Like, it's just <laughs> like, so I think being, you know, understanding on both sides. So. Yeah. Yes. And it's also great to have language partners in, in that sense mm. that you have an agreement. Okay. For half an hour, we'll speak in this language. And after half an hour, we'll switch right. or an agreement. I, I can speak my language and you can speak yours or mm. I can speak yours and you can speak mine. It's just different what suits people. Yeah, absolutely. For people who want to learn, do you recommend that they go to the university or do you think that it's possible for them to learn all on their own with the resources that are currently out there? Uh, I have to say that um, it would be great to have more research resources and that's something we have to keep uh, working on adding more resources out there. Um, but yeah, I, I recommend the program at the University of Iceland, but that's not to say that there's that's the only way because mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of language schools, indiv uh, independent language schools as well. And for some people, it also works well to um, self-teach yourself. There's um, material online and in right. books. And for some people, they just need to speak. And there's these um, classes all over the city um, the library and city, mm -hmm. the Red Cross, um, different organizations are offering Icelandic classes that are mm -hmm. mostly based on, on speaking practices. And I, I've met people who've done incredibly well also by just speaking, speaking, speaking and meeting up yeah. to um, events like that. Yeah, great. Yeah, and then just to be clear, the course you're talking, or at least the um, classes that you're talking about for Icelandic, are for Icelandic as a second language because there's also another one where it's just a year long one. And I don't know if you recommend that one as well, but like I've heard mixed reviews about the year long one. That's um, that's a little bit more basic. Whereas the bachelor's in Icelandic as a second language is way more 
in depth. Like it's a lot more work, uh, of course, but also like you learn a lot as far as I've heard from lots of people. Is that what you're talking, are you talking about the distinction between those two or? No, I wasn't mentioning the distinction between the two. Um, but as you say, there's the diploma that's only a year, which is yeah. more of an introductionary course or, or preparing people to then um, take the test that you have to uh, pass to enter the bachelor degree. Mm, okay. So you um, can start the diploma without any um, basic, um, you don't have to know anything when you start the diploma, but you have to pass um, a certain uh, level before entering mm. the bachelor. So that's the main okay. difference I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, I didn't know that you had to pass the test. <laughs> I've, mm -hmm. I've never looked into it, so this is also really interesting. So, okay, that's good to know. So for there are some people who are such beginners that the diploma makes sense for them so they can qualify to get into the bachelor's program. Mm -hmm. in essence. Got it. Okay. All right, well, that's also helpful for, because I would have, I just thought that people could just sign up for the bachelor's and like, and that would be it. And you just kind of dive into it and see how it goes, you know? Um, I mean, if you qualify, obviously. So. Yeah, um, I don't know what exactly the level is, but yeah, there's some basic uh, background that people have to have in Icelandic before starting some basic mm -hmm. knowledge of the the grammar and a bit of vocabulary, so. Yeah, so the one year diploma is, is a good um, practice or, um, yeah, skill, gives you the skills to go on to the next level. Great. And for your workbook that you mentioned a little bit earlier, when is that planned to, to come out? I'm hoping it can come out this fall, fingers crossed. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But it's in the finishing stages and I'll soon send it to my editor. So it's it's there in the process it's everything is happening fast now <laughs> great and i'm just going to put up your instagram account and I'll, of course you. we'll have a link to that so for people who do want to keep up with what caritas is doing as well as maybe interact with her of course uh, ask questions or you know just send her any feedback uh, if you're enjoying her books if you're looking forward to new you know things that are coming out of you i'm guessing you know you're open to different types of interactions. So of course you can follow her over there. And, you know, I'm, like I mentioned, just like really grateful for people like you who are thinking about how else we all can learn. I mean, Icelandic is special to me because I'm living here, right? But I think in general, like you're saying, as um, a language where it's not that many people that speak it and the amount of resources feels very limited, they are growing, but it's just mm -hmm. at a pace that, you know, is, makes sense a little bit when you think about how many people speak it, but um, there was this petition, I don't know how it's doing, for Duolingo to add uh, Icelandic as a language. I don't know if you saw that, so, you know. I didn't, I hope, but yeah. that would be great. Yeah, the more researchers, the better. Yeah, exactly. And what kind of feedback are you getting about your, your book so far? Oh, I, I love hearing from readers and and teachers um, that have been using stories from the book. Um, I've heard that the story has been used at all uh, school levels except mm. kindergarten in, in Iceland. <laughs> so Fair that's enough. amazing that there's a really uh, wider readership than uh, I expected uh, mm. when I uh, started this journey of writing the stories. Um, and I've there's 100 universities abroad that teach Icelandic, old or new Icelandic. There's hundreds, wow. yeah. So 100 is, is a big number. And I don't know everyone, of <laughs> course, but I, I've heard um, that, um, yeah, the stories have, have spread to uh, Japan, Italy, Scotland, and wow. Canada. So it's wonderful to, yeah, also hear from readers directly. Um, I did see her with their... Um, they allowed me to share the messages on the Instagram account, but it, it's yeah. it's lovely to hear, for example, from a um, North American uh, man of Icelandic descent who is reconnecting with the language of mm. his ancestors and, and an Icelandic uh, man who grew up in Australia and is also mm. connecting with, with the language and, and a woman who is now living in, in Iceland and working hard to uh, 
learn Icelandic and read the stories with her uh, Icelandic husband and yeah. they were enjoying reading it together. So that's yeah. sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad because yeah, I definitely, I feel like it really would touch so many different types of learners. And mm -hmm. I think it's really cool also that children are, you know, of ages that can understand are getting a chance to be introduced to it too. And, you know, maybe this would be something that's part of um, for children that are learning Icelandic as a second language, meaning they're moving to the country from somewhere else, this could be helpful for them just to, cause like we've mentioned like their short stories, they help you learn about Iceland. So yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Yes. And I haven't uh, looked too much into it, but I think one of the interesting thing on the elementary school level is that maybe uh, both readers of uh, Icelandic as a first and second language could enjoy reading the stories together perhaps mm. because they're so short. So that's also um, a new perspective. And of course they could then do different exercises with the stories, but possibly they could enjoy the stories together. Um, yeah. So that, that's something to think about. Yeah. Have you thought about going back into teaching Icelandic as a second language? Uh, I really do enjoy writing. So at the moment, yeah. uh, and with my PhD, I'm um, focusing on the writing, but I do love to teach. And um, yeah, who knows? Maybe in yeah. the future, I'll go back to uh, teaching Icelandic as a second language. Yeah, maybe some lucky students will have you. <laughs> uh, Perhaps. <thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to, I don't know if there's anything else you want to mention before we end off with the last question. Uh, I guess I just want to add that in both of the books, there's an appendix with mm -hmm. additional information. So because we've been talking about how cultural the stories are mm -hmm. and they're on different, different difficulty levels. But um, if people want to know more, there's often um, more resources in the back. For okay. example, explaining further who's the person mentioned in this story mm -hmm. or what exactly is this tradition or when is this date on the calendar exactly so right. um yeah people don't have to go too far to get more information that the, the stories might um provoke and also with allusions to icelandic yeah history and culture and sometimes um poems or lullabies that i have in the mm, book um okay. it's not something i expect readers to understand uh, or know of all of it but yeah, by looking in the appendix, they can see what that is all about. Awesome. Actually, before I get to the last question, I did have one other question, and that mm -hmm. was regarding your Japanese. So have you kept up with that um, since you stopped studying or stopped living in Japan? Yeah, my Japanese is quite rusty at the moment. Um, yeah. I feel like English is taking over my brain <laughs> uh, momentarily, I hope, uh, only momentarily while I'm working on my PhD project, mm -hmm. which is all in English. But um, I hope I can quickly brush off my Japanese again when I have some quiet time because I did keep it up um, the years that followed and I had yeah. language uh, partners um, for a couple of years after I moved back. Mm -hmm. So Japanese students, um, either exchange students or international students at the University of Iceland, we would uh, meet and do a language exchange. Um, nice. So that was a great way for me to keep speaking Japanese and not lose it all at once. Yeah. But of course, it's easy to get rusty. Um, and that's with all languages. You have to use it to um, keep up your ability and yeah. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Yes, you, you have to exercise that muscle for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my last question for you, which I ask everyone is, what is your favorite Icelandic word or phrase? There's uh, just so many, it's hard to choose from, but because I do really love uh, play of words, I thought maybe I, I'd um, share one of the stories. Is that okay? From yeah. uh, Artir. Um, the story is called uh, Viltu toga i tunguna. Um, can you pull out my tongue? Mm -hmm. um, Viltu toga i tunguna. Egil er úti að ganga með hundinn sinn. Það er kalt en fallegt veður. 
trénskarta nýjum laufblöðum. Þeir ganga niður götuna, það eru fáur bílar við húsin. Flestir virðast ennþá verið í vinnunni. Hundurinn stoppar og gerir þarfir sínar. Egill fer í úlpuvasan og næri lítinn póka. Hann beygir sig niður og setur skítin í pókan. Þegar hann lítur upp stendur hjá hann strákur. Hæ, segir strákurinn. Viltu tóga í tunguna? Ha, segir Egill. Viltu laga tunguna? Ha, endur tekur Egill. Hvað segiru? Það er svo erfitt að reyma, segir strákurinn. Viltu hjálpa mér? Já, þannig, segir Egill. Hann beygir sig niður og hjálpar strákunum að reyma skóna sína. Svona, segir Egill þegar hann er búin. Takk, segir strákurinn og hleypur á stað. So this story is about um, how the word tongue can both be the tongue in your mouth and the tongue on your shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and about this misunderstanding that happens when a man is out walking his uh, dog and there's this boy that asks him to pull at his tongue and yeah. actually <laughs> asking him to help him tie his shoes. <laughs> this is really cute. <laughs> and I'll just, so I think you said Tunga is the Tunga. word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting this here yes. for people who want to see this. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, and I think that's also really sweet too, because it's like a little entertaining and the double meanings and words, which there are plenty of those in Icelandic and plenty of those in many languages, really. Mm -hmm. um, even words where it, the official meaning might not be that, but maybe the colloquial use of the word can be this. But like, as we mentioned before we started, like the tongue of your shoe is something that we use in, Iceland in English too. Yeah. So people would get it, at least so they would get the joke. You know what I mean? So that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I really appreciate you coming on. All links to what you're working on, including uh, what you're posting on Instagram, will be in the description for people who are interested. I'm sure this would be really useful for so many because I get this question a lot, <laughs> which is like, what resources do you recommend? It's like, there's, it's funny, like, even though there are, not a lot in comparison to other languages, there are still a decent amount, you know? And I, but I think this in particular, kind of graded readers, I think they're called, um, really provides people with the opportunity to feel like they can understand which level they're on, they're on and also like elevates, you know, within that too, to kind of challenge themselves independently, which is great. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I. I really enjoy re uh, writing these stories and I, and I enjoy sharing them with my readers. So I hope you enjoy and that you read for pleasure as well. Uh, because yeah, language learning should be fun. <laughs> exactly. Totally agree. And I hope everyone checks it out who's interested. As always, thank you so much for watching and or listening. Thank you, Caritas, again for coming on and sharing about what you're doing. And I look forward to seeing everyone in the next video. Bye.